Ladies and gentlemen, please excuse me. I would like to take this opportunity to introduce Mr. Peter Nabokov. Mr. Nabokov, first I'd like to give you some background about Mr. Nabokov. Mr. Nabokov has received his BS degree from Columbia <laughs> University and his master's from Goddard College. He's also the author of two books, Two Leggings, The Making of a Crow Warrior, and Tierrina and the Courthouse Raid. He is currently at work on a second volume of a Native American testimony, which will cover the period from the latter part of the 19th century to the present. Mr. Nabokov has spent more than five years gathering this material for Native American testimony. As a research associate of the Museum of American Indian, he has had access to major archives of Native American materials all across the country. He has lived in various capacities, worked on the Crow, Sioux, Penobscot, Navajo, Alabama, and Cosada reservations. I'd like to take Mr. I'd like to introduce Mr. Peter Nabokov. Sorry, I wanted, I wanted it out of my way. I just got off my way. Last weekend, I flew in a single-engine plane <clears throat> to a community called Four Bears in the center of North Dakota overlooking the Missouri. It is in the heart of Mandan, Hidatsa, and Arikara country, what's left of it. I was in a bar there when a tall Indian wheeled around on his bar stool, <clears throat> pinned my eyes with his, and said slowly as if speaking to an unseen audience behind my head, those white people are drowning me out. I looked around for the culprit while his eyes bored through me, then back. What me, Indian scholar, collector of Indian testaments about Indian white relations, but of course he was on the mark. For the Garrison Dam Reservoir that drowned the Mandan sacred town sites in 1955 was as personally felt and as impersonally leveled against an entire civilization, the most ancient in the Great Plains, I might add, as his general accusation was aimed at a not-looking, not-seeing way of life that was represented at that moment by white-faced, well-meaning, middle-aged me. Then on a huge jet barreling home two days later, I sat beside a businessman puffing on a pipe who glanced out the window at the neatly framed and tamed, miniaturized Rocky Mountains down below, then turned to ask if I had ever driven across the country. I said I'd thumbed across a number of times, and he said with a curious tone of longing in his voice, you know, it seems almost sacrilegious to go over it like this without having to go from place to place and getting sort of to know the land. And that was his word, sacrilegious. I thought later how their comments shared a sense of loss, but were as wide apart as the Atlantic Ocean in the context they brought to this land. And I was struck anew by the immense gulf between a people for whom the land and its creatures provided identity and spiritual connection, and a people who had never really acknowledged this inner power, this sacred force, and so had had come to exploit it to their peril. I want to say at the outset that I speak here as a student of Native American traditions, not as white shaman or participant in any Native American religious disciplines. I am one of the wanderers across this land, too often above it, who has nonetheless sensed its powers <clears throat> and has been at a loss to reach them. I believe with Carl Jung that human beings cannot flourish in a spiritual desert no matter how effectively they control the water, manage the wilderness, or tear out the riches of the earth. And I believe that unholy treatment of the environment reflects poverty of the soul. And I believe it is long time in the past to ask some, new, some old questions anew and to reconstitute some homegrown ways for reuniting with the sky, the earth, and our brothers and sisters, the four-leggeds and the wingeds, who in their wisdom have lived here so long. I believe, as Jung wrote in one of the very last letters of his life, as death approached, and of all the world's spiritual disciplines he had studied, he turned to Native America. And he said, we are sorely in need of a truth or a self-understanding similar to that of ancient Egypt, which I have found still living with a Taos Pueblo. Their chief of ceremonies, Mountain Lake, said to me, we are the people who live on the roof of the world. We are the sons of the sun, who is our father. We help him daily to rise and to cross over the sky 
And we do this not only for ourselves, but for the Americans also. Therefore, they should not interfere with our religion. But if they continue to do so and hinder us, they will see that in 10 years the sun will rise no more. And Jung added, he correctly assumes that their day, their light, their consciousness, and their meaning will die when destroyed through the narrow-mindedness of American rationalism. And the same will happen to the whole world. But we are talking here not only of a relationship to a landscape and earth and sky that we can see, but of an inner landscape, the soul behind the surface that our eyes pick up, the kind of landscape that the artist chronicler George Catlin could not comprehend when in the 1830s he was halted from his explorations in the banks of the St. Peter's River while searching for the fabled quarries of sacred red pipestone. A Dakota named the Swift Man tried to persuade Catlin to turn back arguing that whites had already desecrated the sacred material by turning it into trinkets. But Catlin replied he meant no harm and brandished the all-important passport of objective scientific inquiry. The Dakota still resisted, trying with words to explain, and Catlin's account has them practically saying to him, you will not see what you are going to see. Behind the standoff lay two conflicting views of the earth, and guess which one? Catlin did reach the quarry, and the brick red soapstone was henceforth named Catlinite, and we all know that we own what we name. Not until the 1920s did the Yankton Dakota secure the site back, and they had to have it designated a historical site, not a holy shrine, to safeguard it. This inner landscape was the same terrain which a Zapotec Indian in the highlands of Oaxaca told me about last year as we were cutting alfalfa with hand sickles side by side. I had asked about house blessing ceremonies. Did his people have them as the natives of North America did? He didn't look up at me, but said methodically, when we build a house and it is finished, the Catholic priest comes and our relatives come and he blesses it with holy water and we have a feast. But I pressed him, what about, build, what about blessing the building site itself? There was some silence and the swish of our sickles and then he stopped and looked at me and spoke very softly under his breath. When we lay out a house, we first bless the land. We feed the land. Maybe it is a superstition, but we feel it is our mother, and that is our old, old belief. So we kill a turkey or a chicken, and an old man, one of our own, sprinkles its blood in the corners. We bury chocolate there and tobacco, and we pray together, and this way we feed the land, which, as I have said, is our mother, and then later we let the priest come and do his blessing. This is the same inner landscape that continues to preoccupy Native American traditions and those invested with its survival. Orrin Lyons, an Onondaga medicine man, gave the writer Scott Mamaday a vivid look at the process of transmitting this basic teaching. As Lyons told it, I was fishing with my uncle, he's an old chief from home, and we were out there in, the, in a boat in the middle of the lake and talking about this and that. I had just graduated from college at that point, you know, and I was kind of feeling my oats a bit, and we were talking, and he said, my, you're pretty smart, you know, you've learned a lot of things. And I said, yeah, I was surprised. And he said, good, then you ought to know who you are. Sure, I said, I'm Fallen Lyons. He said, yeah, that's who you are, I guess. Is that all? So I started to suspect right away something is going on here. Here I am in a boat and I can't get out. And we're out in the middle of the water and he said, that's your name all right, we know that. Is that all you are? Well, then I started thinking. I started to feel a little track already and I went to my father's line, my mother's line, my clan. I searched and he chased me all over that boat for two hours. He wouldn't let me out. I was ready to swim. I was getting mad. And then I said, well, who the hell am I then? And he said, well, I think you know. But I will tell you, if you sit here and look right over there, look at that, the rock, the way they are, the trees and hills all around you, right where you're on, it's water. And he said, you're just like that rock. And I listened. And he said, you're the same as the water, this water. I waited and listened again. As he said, you're the ridge, that ridge. You're here in the you were here in the beginning. You're as strong as they are. And as long as you believe in that, he said, that's who you are. That's your mother, and that's you, and don't forget it. And I never have. Looming behind these suggestive reflections of that inner landscape where the terrain throbs with possibility and meaningful connections are centuries of conceptualize, conceptualizing by Indian visionaries and thinkers who created a library's worth of native categories and definitions and mythologies, each enshrining down to the particular boulder, brook, and bend in the coulee their surroundings, turning them into a complex sacred geography. Let's take an irreverently shallow, speedy, and generalized look at the, native, at the natural world through Indian eyes but in white man's categories and build it up from the elements, earth, air, fire, and water. 
As the Dakota author St Luther Standing Bear tells us, it was not only on holy days and feast days that his people acknowledged their intrinsic bond to the earth. The old people came literally to love the soil, he tells us. They sat on the ground with a feeling of being close to a mothering power. It was good for the skin to touch the earth, and the old people liked to remove their moccasins and walk with bare feet on the sacred earth, for the soil was soothing, strengthening, cleansing, and healing. Equally precious and powerful was fire, granting man light, linking it with the sun, preserving the spark of life. As the Chippewa philosopher advises his people, the fire must never be suffered to go out in your lodge. Summer and winter, day and night, in storm or when it is calm, you must remember that the life in your body and the fire in your lodge are the same and of the same date. If you suffer your fire to be extinguished, at that moment your life will be at its end. Thus among the Natchez, the last of the great southeastern mound builder cultures to last into historic times, a temple housed a perpetual flame fed by only three pointed sticks. Perpetual, that is, until the French brutally destroyed their temples in the 18th century and extinguished that flame. Of water, too, there is no end of references to inner powers waiting to be liberated through ritual inroads. The Navajo take pains to distinguish used water, which is less than human and controlled, irrigation water, for example, and untouched water, generally free-flowing, which the Pawnee would insist, which is superhuman and sacred. Naturally, the agricultural pueblos yearn for an especially bountiful relationship with water, water which is the blood of the land, as is evoked by this Zuni formula for drawing down rain. When our earth mother is replete with living waters, when the spring comes, the source of our flesh, all the different kinds of corn, we shall lay to rest in the ground. With our earth mother's living waters, they will be made into new beings, coming out standing into the daylight of their son father, calling for rain to all sides, they will stretch out their hands. And then from wherever the rainmakers stay quietly, they will send their misty breath. Their massed clouds filled with water will come out and sit with us far from their homes. With outstretched hands of water, they will embrace the corn, stepping down to caress them with their fresh waters, with their fine rain caressing the earth. And yonder, where the roads of the rainmakers come forth, torrents will rush forth, silt will rush forth, mountains will be washed out, logs will be washed down. Yonder, all the mossy mountains will drip with water. The clay-lined hollows of our earth mother will overflow with water, desiring that it should be thus, I send forth my prayer. Just as this Zuni incantation celebrates their essential dependence on the circular flow of liquid between earth and cloud and back again, so the Navajo bring into their tribal ancestry the intermingling of rivers. Colorado River is female, they say. San Juan River is male. And at the place where the two used to come together, where the San Juan mounted the Colorado, an infinite number of water children were formerly born, cloud and rain people, who then would drift southeastward. And air for the Indian, air is never air. We breathe the air, the breath of our father. Our breath transforms into words. The smoke of the pipe, the steam of the bath, the absorption of the feelings behind our prayers into rising clouds of intensified hope. For the wind talks to the Cree hunter from the voice of Cheotenchu, as it talks to the Eskimo from the voice of Sila. And what does it say, asked the explorer Rasmussen of the Netsilic shaman. It says, the old man replied, always the same thing, be not afraid of the universe. In Eskimo, the word to make poetry is the word to breathe. Songs are thoughts, it is said in the North, sung out with a breath when people are moved by great forces and ordinary speech no longer suffices. And far south, with the Zuni again, the people of the middle place sing too of the potentialities of air. My divine father's living, life-giving breath his breath of old age, his breath of waters, his breath of seeds, his breath of riches, his breath of fecundity, his breath of power, his breath of strong spirit, his breath of all good fortune whatsoever, asking for his breath and into my warm body, drawing his breath, I add to your breath now. Let no one despise the breath of his fathers, but into your bodies draw their breath. That yonder to where the road of our son father comes out, your roads may reach that clasping hands, holding one another fast, you may finish your roads. To this end, I add to your breath now. But of course, these elements were not discrete, divided into test tubes, classified by color and weight, 
It was in dramatized combustion that they fused, and Native American man invented ingenious ways to join with them so as to fully experience their essential meaning. The Mistassini Cree decorator of his drum or dish would paint five red dots to commemorate a time when, out hunting, a huge column of light had broken through thunderheads to illuminate a patch of forest where moose did indeed prove to be standing shoulder to shoulder. In a dream, he had already witnessed the magical mixing of air and fire and water. Now it was fulfilled in the giant amphitheater of landscape. And all elements combined in the sweat bath. As earthen rocks heated cherry red by fire, which signified the sun's core to the Aglala seer black elk, sizzled with the running water of the river, dashed from whips of sweet sage, creating stinging scented steam. Not just the privilege of mystics, all experience on their nerve ends a release, a purge, a transformation as that of rain from clouds. Inside the sweat, prayers begin, the pipe is smoked, the door flap is hurled aside, and the steam bearing the essence of prayers billows into the night sky. During the Hako celebration of the Pawnee, a complex communal blessing for the well-being of children, there was a secondary ritual which involved that time-honored mechanism for inner growth, the pilgrimage. At their, as their journey commences through a consecrated landscape, the celebrants are introduced by a priest, Kurahus, to the esoteric secret meaning of the elements of water, of the winds of fire and the earth. When the wanderers first catch sight of water, the priest leads them in a chant to, quote, the river glistening in the sunlight in its length. And upon nearing the bank, they sing now to the river in it that ripples as it runs. And here the instructions for crossing the stream become unusually precise until we realize he is transforming the simplest fording of a river into a moving meditation. Timed to a sequence of chants, the pilgrims plunge their, naked, plunge their naked legs through. And once on the other side, the priest commands them to freeze. We are wet with water through which we have just passed, he explains. But we must not touch our bodies where we are wet, for the running water is sacred. So we will sing the first stanza of this song. And we will call on the wind, Hotoru, to come and touch us that we may become dry. Then. As the wind circles about the beads of sacred water on their calves, as the Pawnee describe it, touching us here and there, completely enveloping us, the chant times the process we know as evaporation, the transmutation of water and air, registered on everyone's skin. And as the song climaxes, the celebrants are dry, the sacrament is complete, and their journey resumes. While to the Pawnee, the pilgrimage is but an episode in a vaster symphonic ceremony for other Native American societies, it was and remains a critical avenue for consecration of landscape and the doorway to a sacral state of being. It unified men with mountains and trees, rivers and rainbows. It regulated the risks of crossing into the living realm of myth, generally beyond centers of human traffic, out there with a series of stations, shrines, preordained in primordial times to mirror interior stages of movement toward psychic integration. To the devoted seeker, it held out the promise of identity and power and a personal experiencing of that goal of esoteric disciplines the world over, the breakdown of the separation between me and the infinite. Thus, when the Huichol Indians journey from their homeland in the Sierra Madre of northwestern Mexico to Catorce, the far desert in the state of San Luis Potosí, they exchange an erodible, changing landscape for a timeless one. They are entering what they call the middle world, where godliness of place infuses every spring, pool, plant, cave, ravine, and hill. This land has been religiously recreated. It is now the home of Tamatz Kayumari, elder brother of Deer Tail. It is not Katorse. It is that mythic expanse the Huichol call Wirikuta, the cradle of their creation. And it is here through an interlocking choreography of prayer, dance, offering, and journey that they enter the incontrovertible verification of their mythology. Here they taste eternity. Here they recover the deer and corn, magically transmuted into the ground-hugging cactus known as peyote. And similarly, the Papago, on their grueling pilgrimage westward from southern Arizona to the salt beaches of the California Gulf, see behind the salt that is their ostensible objective, the corn that at home gives them life. 
As they plant prayer sticks at stages, they, their experience culminates in a sacramental plunge into the ocean. Likewise, the Zuni, Akuma, Laguna, Kochiti, and Hopi undertake seasonal ritualized journeys through a religiously encoded landscape to become good hunters, fighters, husbands, fathers, singers, and shamans. Indians were the land's grateful occupiers and custodians. Their rituals were synchronized with its seasons. Its trees, wildlife, and climate figured as supernatural forces in their folklore. In virtually every tribal domain, sacred mountains overlooked not wilderness, but realms which were only unknown when one's communion with them had not yet been revealed. To be sure, awareness of the power of place grounds the belief systems of man everywhere and memory of an era when the land shimmered in mystery is not restricted to Native America. I am reminded of a National Geographic journalist who wrapped up a whirlwind visit to Australia with an obligatory stopover at an Aborigine refugee camp. After his superficial tour, he was on the verge of boarding his plane when he noticed an elderly Aborigine standing expectantly beside him. A question was on his mind. Did we have people who had been in our country as long as his had been in Australia? Well, the writer said, we have Indians who have probably been there that long. The Aborigine smiled knowingly. Then they must have lived in the time we dream about, he said, and they must have sacred places in the land as we have. But we need not stray so far from the roots of Western man. There is an old town on a ridge in the Judean mountains that Hebrew texts tell us was founded on the site of an ancient spring, the Gihon. The Jews, following earlier Greek customs of hallowing homes of earth spirits, knew this spot as the navel of the earth, the foundation stone from which the world started, a site just like the earthen bulge along a feeder canyon of the Colorado that the Hopi call Sipapu, and from which they emerged onto the earthly plain. But something curious happens here, for the Islam, for Islam also reveres this place as the hub of its universe, and Muslim pilgrims are still drawn to a holy rock situated on an invisible line between Allah's throne above and a cave below where the souls of the dead congregate twice weekly. Before the creation of man, they believe, angels visited this very rock 2,000 times. It is a survivor of paradise. All the sweet waters of the earth pour from it, and it was from this cosmic rock that Muhammad was launched into a dreamlike journey to the heavens where he witnessed the eternal combat between good and evil, and he even saw Abraham, Moses, and Jesus. But to make matters more complicated for the administration that must safeguard these original earth spirit shrines of modern day Jerusalem, a third religion claims the place. Through fancy theological footwork, Christianity says Jerusalem is the umbilicus mundi, the microcosm of the universe where its tribes would gather annually for rites of cosmological renewal. But let's swing back to North America <clears throat> and remind ourselves what happened when the descendants of those tribal Christians hit the shores of this Holy Land. Ironically named pilgrims, these visitors honored the conquest and domestication of nature. And in Papago folklore, the first contact experience is fixed in one horrifying recollection. <clears throat> the first whites they crept up to spy upon near Casablanca were cutting trees to make a road. Everywhere, the Anglo leveled and cultivated forest lands, settled in towns modeled after those in Europe, slaughtered game en masse, dammed the rushing waters, and mined the earth's holy rocks. Defining land as commodity, he bought it, subdivided it, and created environmental distortions hardly to be imagined. We were content to let things remain as the great spirit made them, Chief Joseph of the Nez Perce prophetically commented in 1871. They were not and would change the rivers if it did not suit them. And today, as the monk seal sinks out of sight in the Caribbean, and the birds and beaches of Brittany gasp for breath through their oil-clogged pores, the governor of my home state dreams of space colonies to push man further from his garbage and his desecration. Did it have to be this way, we ask? Is the inner landscape, the power of wild place, to heal and renew and harbor mystery some piece of hippie nostalgia, part of the glib harmony with nature ethic that gets sentimentalists teary-eyed along with Iron Eyes Cody? Well, a great philosopher of Western culture provided the invaders with advice they did not follow in this regard. 
In his Republic, Plato instructs settlers in a new country that they will only succeed in their colonization if they first discover the shrines and sacred places of the local deities and reconsecrate them to the corresponding principles in the colonists' religion. This creates a continuity of sacred sites tied to a sacred calendar, to offerings and pilgrimages and rites of renewal. This, it is the, this is the strategy, the, stra, the, stra, the strategy that the Catholics attempted, along with brutal conquest to be sure, in Mexico and Peru, but it may be what has kept the heartbeats of those nations profoundly Indian to this very day. And in ancient China, a scientific discipline was invented to assure harmony between man's habitations and movements and the earth spirits. Known as Feng Shui, this great environmental doctrine has been defined as the art of adapting the residences of the living and the dead so as to cooperate and harmonize with the local currents of cosmic thought. Throughout the long continuity of Chinese development, from the building of rural villages in the mountains to great modern cities along industrial rivers, Feng Shui has regulated growth and proportion, development and recognition of the land's sacred power. As, the 19th century, as a 19th century British clergyman, one of the tradition that launched the crusade against the Holy Land of America wished a hundred years ago, would God that our own men of science had preserved that sacred awe and trembling fear of the mysteries of the unseen, that firm belief in the realities of the invisible world and its constant intercommunication with the seen and the temporal, which characterized the Chinese gropings after natural science. American men of science have little interest in such superstitious nonsense, but the good cleric need only have gone to Taos, New Mexico to see the American equivalent of Feng Shui in one of the country's longest pitched battles over a sacred landscape and watch it win. The stunning backdrop of the five-storied Pueblo of Taos in far northern New Mexico is Taos Mountain and the 48,000 acres of forested land that it overlooks. Buried deep in this glorious countryside is Blue Lake, a cherished place of pilgrimage for the ancient Pueblo. In 1906, these ancestral lands were summarily appropriated from Taos by the Theodore Roosevelt administration and reconsecrated all right as Carson National Forest, named for that soldier who flushed the Navajos out of Canyon de Chez 50 years earlier. Immediately, the Pueblo began its patient, determined, almost Gandhian campaign to retrieve the territory. As one scans their testimonies before Congress in the 20s, the 40s, the 60s, it is as if it was one single flowing, painstaking effort to explain what could only be felt, to portray what could not be seen, the holiness of place. August le legislators like State Senator Clinton Anderson could never understand why the Taos people needed all that land. They tried to pin them down. Why did 16,000 acres needed for a church? Now I'd like to ask a question, said a House Committee Chairman in 1943. Do you have any place in that territory that's yours which you would not object to drilling? And Taos Council Member Ferlino Martinez answered, every inch of our land is religious land, a place of sacred shrines, and there is no place you could put a dam without hurting the Indians. Well, what about exploratory drilling? Wasn't there some place where we could test for materials which would not be offensive to your religion? And Martinez replied, whether you put a little sugar on this bill or not, it still will not taste good to us. While another Taos man testified at the same hearing, now we have very good friends among the white people and we have some bad enemies too among the white people. Some want to find out what are the sacred shrines. The only answer to that would be foolish. It would be to send a telegram to Jesus Christ to find out. And then when you get an answer, then the Indians can be notified, and then you will know as to why and how those most sacred places are planned and reserved for us. And over a century later, the Pueblo's spiritual leader, Juan de Jesus Romero, wrapped up the Taos argument. Our Blue Lake wilderness keeps our water holy, and by the water we are baptized. If our land is not returned to us, it is turned over to the government for its use, then that is the end of Indian life. Our people will scatter as the people of other nations have scattered. It is our religion that holds us together. At the end of that year, on December 15, 1970, to be precise, in a rare act equal to the wild inspiration to visit China, President Richard Nixon signed into law the restoration of the Tao's sacred ancestral lands, all 48,000 acres in perpetuity. But the sacred pipestone quarry and the Tao's victory were token bows to the earth spirit, legislative write-offs to avoid a bad press. 
what is needed to respect the equally sacred sites of the Hoopa, the Yurok, the Penobscot, the Winnebago, the Cree, the Chumash, and countless Native American nations is the same kind of legislation which Israel had to institute when its new conquest, conquests brought those Christian and Islamic places of pilgrimage under its rule. On June 27, 1967, the Israeli Knesset enacted a protection of holy places law, which read, one, the holy places shall be protected from desecration and from any other violations, and from anything likely to violate the freedom of access to the members of the various religions, and to places sacred to them or to their feelings with regard to those places. And two, whoever desecrates or otherwise violates a holy place shall be locked up for seven years. But of course, before that can ensure the perpetuation of the many overlapping tribal holy lands that once made this continent a throbbing hub of invisible power, the yearning for them in us must be revitalized in our hearts. If this inner landscape is to be freed from the chains of dams and suffocation of chemical air, each of us must commit herself or himself to a true revolution of consciousness. Each of us must admit that we are in the dictionary definition of a pilgrim, a stranger in a strange land, in urgent search to break through our skins and experience in whatever ways we are graced to do so and work to do so, our timelessness and the interwoven relationships of all combination of elements. We are children of the stars, the Pawnees knew. We carry the substance of the earth and the heavens within ourselves. We need unquestioned protection for her places of spirit and power, even when many of us do not know where they are or why. That is not our knowledge at first. It is the knowledge of the remnant societies who spent generations evolving sane reciprocal relationships with her. And then we must find ways to respectfully ask of Indian communities to be taught those why, fors, and wheres. We may need to ask a number of times with proper offerings and patience in the tried and true manner of sincere, sincere disciples. <clears throat> we must then ask to share the use of this inner landscape in a new age when its powers are more dearly needed than ever before. And even then, we, may, we must be willing, unlike George Catlin, to accept no for an answer and still have the basic decency to make certain that her desecration stops now. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nabokov. I would like to say that because of a problem in scheduling, that uh, Mr. Nabokov will only have a few moments to spend with us because he has to make a, a 2.20 flight from Des Moines. So if you'd like a uh, question and answer setting now, uh, why don't we go ahead and pursue that? All right, so. I'm going to stay seated if I may. Um, we do have time.